Well, I'll kick this off. My name is Dave Ashheim, and I founded the company Guide by Cell about eight years or so ago. And I think we have maybe 30 or 40 or 50 different folks on the phone today from everybody where from uh, libraries to I see the Tennessee Aquarium to Valley Forge to little historical museums. So thanks for coming today. We are going to try to end this around uh, 45 minutes from now. And uh, we are going to make it very interactive. So make sure you have your cell phones handy and you know how to text. And if you don't know how to text, this is the time to either learn or find some 19-year-old uh, nearby that can teach you. Um, Catherine runs our marketing. And say hello, Catherine. Hi, everyone. This is Catherine. And she'll also be taking all of your questions in the little chat window. So because of feedback, the best way to ask questions, and we want this to be really fun and interactive, is to ask your questions in the little chat window. So everybody go ahead while I'm uh, talking away. If you want to, just do what what um, what Faith has done and, and um, type in where you're from and... Um, what organization you're with. I see here that Ben and a few other people are having some difficulties. We'll give you a different phone number to try. There's Darren. Darren's going to be one of our speakers. Okay, so I'm going to dive right into this, and we're going to make this zippy and fast, and we're going to show you about 25 different examples. So it's going to be uh, uh, quick. Um, a little bit about us. Started in 2004, so it's now been nine or ten years. We're one of the largest providers of anything with mobile in the country. We've got about 4,000 clients all over the world, from China to London to Germany to Canada, Mexico, U.S. Most are in the U.S. because that's where we're based. We're based here in San Francisco. Um, and uh, many of the folks that are online, we have met in person, and then quite a few others we're just starting to meet. So thank you all for coming. We have uh, three special guests today. Darren, uh, do you want to, if, if, if you're not muted, Darren, do you want to say hello to everybody? Hello, everybody. Very good. All right. And uh, Darren, do you want to mention where you're from and what you do? And then we'll, uh, have, you, we'll have you actually do your, your little spiel a little bit later. Certainly. I'm Darren Rudloff. I'm the uh, CEO at Visit Cheyenne. We're the official tourism marketing organization for uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. We've been a client with Guide by Cell for um, well, probably six or seven years, and we've developed a citywide system of both audio cell phone tours as well as mobile websites for our museum community. So we have seven uh, museums in the community, and each one of them has a audio cell phone tour, and most of them have mobile websites as well, powered through Guide by Cell. Yeah, great. And then we'll have a little demo in just a second. Lisa, you joined us, I heard, a second ago. So, Lisa, if you're not muted, why don't you just say hello to everybody? Certainly. Um, this is Lisa Eldred, and I am Director of Exhibitions at Denver Botanic Gardens. Um, and we handle art exhibitions, horticultural display, um, and the interpretation related to that. So we've been with Guide by Cell for a long time on and off in different formats, and this year we decided to go with a the mobile website to convey some information about a big art exhibition we have this season. Yeah, and we're going to see it on our phones. It's amazing. And then, Stephanie, I met you maybe six, seven years ago when you were interning at Valley Forge, and now you're a park ranger. So say hello to everybody if you're online. Hey, everybody. I'm Stephanie. I'm the media specialist at Valley Forge National Historical Park. We're about 20 miles northwest of Philadelphia in southeastern Pennsylvania. So we get about 1.9 million visitors a year for the historic aspects and also for the local recreation. Um, we've had a cell phone tour with Guide by Cell since 2006 when I started here. And uh, we are just finishing up our new mobile website. All right. And we're going to see it. And uh, you'll, in fact, you folks will be one of the some of the first people in the country to see what Stephanie's been working on. So um, it's almost done. So you'll see a work in process. 
Um, all right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, mobile, and then we'll uh, go to one of our first speakers, which um, will be Lisa. So when I started the company back in 2004, the question was, what does mobile mean? And mobile at the time was kind of the StarTAC, Motorola phone. And then it moved to all kinds of different devices. The Blackberries were next. And then eventually, iPhones came out, and that was just revolutionary. And of course, now mobile means everything from a computer to a wearable chip. So it has just morphed into... Uh, many different types of devices, and I think in about four or five years, we won't even really be talking about mobile, because mobile will just mean the Internet, and I might get the Internet on my Google Glass, or I might get it on my phone, or some device that I wear in my wrist. So I think all this focus on mobile is just going to all be absorbed by how we behave. So I think it's a transitioning period to the Internet will be everywhere. Um, we're going to talk about three things, some trends, which I'll talk about in the next slide, some specific cultural trends. I've got eight of each, and then um, Lisa and uh, our guests, uh, Darren and Stephanie, will talk a little bit about their institutions, and then I've got about five more slides of what uh, Perez Art is doing and Colonial Williamsburg on their scavenger hunt and Monterey Bay on their text messaging, so we've got quite a few things to show you. Okay, some eight trends, and if, if you folks want a copy of these uh, slides, just send an email to either Dave at Guide Buy Sell or Catherine, and later today we'll give you a copy of all the slides. Hey, Keith, nice to see you from Grounds for Sculpture, my favorite sculpture garden on the East Coast. Um, so here are eight trends. Um, Smartphone penetration was 60% the last time I did this presentation two months ago. I went on the web today, and it's now up to 69.9%, so a 70% smartphone. And what that means for you is that means that uh, 7 out of 10 people are carrying the Internet in their pocket. And when we started talking about apps and um, – in fact, I think we probably started talking with Stephanie about apps and mobile websites two or three years ago. It was a little on the early side. Now that's really not the case. So 7 out of 10 people can access a website on their phone. And if you have additional content, that's a big implication for you. Second point here is, as we all know, we check our phones about 150 times a day. We have a very strong relationship with our phone. So when we started in 2004, using your phone to make a phone call to a museum, that was kind of odd. But now we use our phones for everything from selfies to um, checking scores to uh, alarm clocks and reminders. So it has become an extension of us, which means for you folks, it means people don't mind using their phone today when they're in a garden or a zoo or a museum because that's how they're getting information. Location-based is coming. It hasn't yet arrived in a big way yet for our gardens and zoos and museums, a little bit because of some of the GPS issues and also because not everybody really knows how to turn those features on on their phones. But it's coming pretty quick with wearable technology and with beacons. Another two or three years, it'll all be location-based. Uh, personalized content, that is a big trend. Uh, individuals do not want to have to sort through a lot of content, especially on a mobile device. They want it personalized for them. They also want to make sure that, there's, that it's secure and that it's private. And we've seen a lot of pushback in the last year regarding apps, which is a big surprise to us. Why would that be an issue? And um, what our visitors are telling us uh, or our, our clients' visitors, is some of them are a little nervous about downloading apps. What does that mean? Is there a cookie on their device? Is somebody tracking something? They don't have that same issue with mobile websites, and I think that's why Lisa and Stephanie and Darren, when they talk about mobile websites, it was such a fast way for a person to access something, and there aren't any really security and privacy issues. Wearables is coming in a huge way. You've probably all seen fuel bands. I have a Garmin wrist thing, which counts steps. Wearables is going to be one of the big, big trends in the next two or three years, 
where something that we're wearing is interfacing. So maybe I've got a wristband when I come into a museum. You know, I come into the Tennessee Aquarium, I get a wristband, and wherever I go, it's like a beacon. It's delivering relevant content to me. It's a little on the new side, but it's coming in a big way. Uh, the seventh point, if you've never heard of the Internet of Things and you want to impress your friends at a cocktail party, write that down. Cisco, one of the inventors of the phrase, the Internet of Things, has a great white paper. And it really what it means is that there are something like 7 billion connected devices right now around the world, and that's expected to grow to 50 which means I've got that wristband that I picked up at the Tennessee Aquarium in my little example here, and that's relaying information maybe to my tablet or my laptop. And at the same time, it's relaying information to visitor services and it's sharing content. And maybe it's going into the donor database and it's delivering me some kind of information tailored to me. So it's a very connected world, and as more of us have the phone or a wearable technology, this Internet of Things means it's a lot more interconnectedness. And mobile is blending work and social. It used to be, you know, that we would have one phone, we'd have a BlackBerry for work, and maybe we'd have a cell phone for, for pleasure. Many of us now are having one phone, one device, which we just use for work and for fun. All right, so uh, as, as I'm speaking, I'm speaking a little rapidly because we have so much to cover. Write your questions in the little meeting chat window. And don't be shy, just keep the questions coming. These trends, we're going to have a slide on, and someone's going to speak on each one of these. We'll start with bring your own device, and then we'll go to some multiple languages. Uh, Lisa's going to talk to us about some of the interpretation at Denver. Uh, more content, fun and easy, and want information now. That's a big trend. Darren's going to talk to us about that. Game-like, we're going to talk about Colonial Williamsburg and their RevQuest spy game. And then uh, marketing and some cross-department cross cooperation we're going to talk about next. All right. So bring your own device. This was the first thing that really happened with mobile. People would see a sign, and they would dial a number and press a key. We have uh, sirens coming around around us, if you can hear that in the background. This information that I'm giving you is so hot, the fire department is on its way. That's uh, lame. Okay. Um, so here we have a picture. I was in Philadelphia recently, and I took a picture at the Mütter Museum, one of the most interesting museums in the country. And there they have a little, a little sign on the left-hand side that says, to learn more about this skull, dial this number and press 62. So it's fun, it's fast, it's really easy to do. It's still the most popular mobile interpretation thing in the country, believe it or not. Even though there's QR codes and, and RSS and smartphone tours and apps, dialing a number, pressing 32, or in this case 62, that seems to be the most popular thing. Uh, go ahead, people. This is our first little demo. Take out your cell phone. Dial that number and press 1 through 8, followed by the pound sign. And when you do, the first couple people that do that, type in the chat window what you, you know, basically what you're hearing. So we'll just give this 30 seconds or so. And we'll wait for somebody to type something in the little chat window. That is the phone number for the museum in Philadelphia. And I think they probably have 100 different little tiny 3 by 5 cards around. I hear in the background some, some of the tour. So let me move on while you're dialing. All right, Kristen says skeletons. All right, excellent, Kristen. So it's okay, since we're all kind of attention deficit, uh, we all have ADD, it's okay to, to multitask. So you can keep listening to the mooter if you like, and uh, pay attention to me too. So multiple languages and greater interpretation. The smartphone, this is an evolution. So the first trend was just dial a number and get something on yep. demand. And the, uh, the second 
slide yep. here. I'm going to have uh, Lisa talk a little bit about this. And um, Lisa at the Denver Botanic Garden, let me move over to um, here is what their tour looks like. And if all of you want to take your phone out right now, go to send a new text message. We're going to have you do this about five more times, so you got to get ready. So if everybody would send a text to 56512, that's the phone number, and type artist in the message, and in the little chat window, tell us what you see, and what you should get back is a text, and... Um, So, did people get a text back? If so, type it in the little chat window, link to Chihuly. Okay, Casey, that's great. And now I'm going to move over to um, Lisa. And Lisa, I've got two slides here. This is a screenshot that I took from my phone. And then we have a nice sign here. So, Lisa, maybe just tell us a little bit about... Um, how you decided to use mobile, what were the pros and the cons, and tell us a little bit about why using mobile and why English and Spanish. Um, well, I mentioned that we had been using the guide by cell call-in number where you push the number prompt and the pound sign um, over a number of years and had sort of you know, had some success with that. And we have done various text message hunts dabbling on and off. We do pop in and out of use of QR codes. I think those, especially as we get used to really, um, you know, the mixed blessing of our smartphones, the, that actually has multiple steps as opposed to just touching my screen. Um, with the Chihuly exhibition and then especially um, just out on the grounds of our gardens, we're a cultural facility right in the middle of Denver, about 24 acres or so, and we have some off-site um, other locations as well. Um, we really have ramped up our commitment to embrace um, the use of Spanish in our signage. So we even did a wayfinding signage pa package um, this season where we've utilized Spanish as well. Um, so we really wanted to come out of the gate this season with the interpretation being dual language as well. Um, with an art exhibition and especially one with um, such as Chihuly. Um, you might have heard of him if you've not, very well-known um, artist who works in glass. Um, we knew the exhibition would be um, wickedly popular for us. And in addition to the aesthetics of not having a huge sign with interpretive messages that we think are important for the public to know, or perhaps they are things the public wants to know, we wanted to let the experience stand um, fairly independently of any messaging. So the signage that we've paired with the art installations um, are essentially what we would call tombstones, not a very nice phrase, um, but really just artist dates, life dates, um, name of the work, title, and those are dual language too. So those are metal signs right near an artwork. Um, but we wanted to have the artist talk, um, and so some of you might be sampling some of those audio tracks. So instead of just having the cell phone audio, um, we decided to go with the mobile platform. And really, I would say, given the crunch time for development for this, it was a late decision, really a huge catalyst for us jumping into this first foray of the mobile website product was the ease um, in making it very much like an app. We've had a missed start or two with app development for the gardens. Um, I think a venue like ours is um, a difficult kind of venue for using electronics in the, the landscape. You know, it's kind of, um, some people might view it as opposite. You just want to come and enjoy nature, not have your device attached to your body. But we all do. And as Dave, you said, that's where everyone goes for information. You know, you sit at dinner and someone asks a question. It's like, well, I'll look up the answer. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then um, without going on too long, I think another um, driver for us to move toward the mobile um, website product, and we really just jumped in to make it happen. We will still even be dumping in content to that that's written. Um, so it's not just audio. Um, 
more and more looking at visitor um, feedback. The one drawback to calling in and listening is that that's really a singular experience. And if you come with a group and want to participate as a group, I think the mobile website platform has a lot to offer. So while ours right now is primarily audio, and you can hear Dale Chihuly speak, different audio clips, etc., and we did a transcription and recorded that in Spanish as well. Um, there is the option where more than one person could read or see details of an artwork, and we have yet to flesh ours out in that way. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a um, quick background. No, that's great. The, uh, let's talk before we move on to the next person. Your decision to go with Spanish. Not every uh, cultural institution we talk to actually takes the time to say, you know what, we want to actually reach out to a specific audience. I take a Spanish in Denver was the, the natural choice. Was it, now that you've been doing it or using it for a month or so, was it worth the effort? Or are you getting any good press out of it? Or are you getting good visitor feedback? Or, I mean, how do you, what, what's your advice, I guess, to all the people that are online thinking, hmm, I have a demographic too, but I don't know if I want to go down that path. What's your, what's your, what's your advice? Um, my advice is that as a nation, we have to jump in. You know, forget all of the political aspect. If you look at which language is spoken second to English in the United States, it's Spanish. Look at AAM's Future for Museums. I mean, the data points to English as a second language almost, but I meant to say Spanish as a second language is the, the yeah. key there. Um, and really, I think this idea about being welcoming, obviously different pockets of um, – there's some great infographics I just looked and some surprising, you know, strong German um, locations or Swiss. I mean, it's obviously geographic, but we can't also even afford or have the time to to embrace that. It's very difficult, but I think to not be afraid of it. And if you want your facility or venue or park or garden, museum, to really just send a message from the get-go that this is a place where multiple language speakers can be welcome. It's even aside from the use, we're kind of beyond that. Like if only seven people have used the Spanish track, it doesn't matter. It's a holistic yeah. effort that you need to to build out over time. So this is just one part of our piece of the puzzle to not even necessarily attract, but better serve. I would say. Right. One more question, then we'll let you go, and you have some other meetings, so you're going to have to, you may have to dash out. Um, statistics, have you, the, the, anything, whether it's us or any product, always has great cloud-based stats. Have you guys used those yet, um, or how would you plan to use those? Because you can look up to see how many people actually looked at a specific page. What's your theory in thinking about some of the stats that comes with cloud-based services? Um, you know, it's good points, and you guys have always had great reporting. So even if you do the call-in piece, you know, where you dial in and punch the number, you can track those users. And that has guided some of our decision-making over time. Now I think while we do have access to that, those stats and um, – I should say that initially when we developed this mobile platform and we we're going to build it out, um, we were thinking of, or we actually did come out the gate and say, okay, people pay a dollar, we'll give you the code, thinking of it much like a, an indoor art museum mm -hmm. wand right. kind of tour. Um, and actually for a variety of reasons it didn't work. I'm definitely one of those people that, you know, is willing to try something. And then, you know, looking at usage and the mechanics of distributing those little cards, we're like, this is a nightmare waiting to happen, if not already happening. So we bagged it. We created the sign for our, our um, point of sale um, visitor services desk that you had shown. So now it's just free. And I think... Mm -hmm. um, Looking at our stats, I was just handed those. I don't have all the secret launch codes to download the reports daily. Yeah, um, yeah. But we have had about, um, well, almost 11,000 um, visits to the Chihuly um, exhibition. The percentage of the overall visitation by comparison, I mean, that's it's not a huge, I'd say maybe it's less than 10% of the visitation that we've had so far. Mm -hmm. um, but I think really adopting the attitude of trying something, building it out, 
um, playing with it. I think so often people are afraid to, without sounding like an infomercial for Guide by Cell necessarily, but yeah. you guys have a great product that really is easy to jump in and just stick with it. Next, we're planning a couple of different outdoor exhibitions next year where we're already thinking you know what, we might try two, which might be crazy. I have no idea. Um, you know, two mm-hmm. separate mobile platforms for the two different exhibitions so that we can address different age demographics. We're doing a Lego exhibition, for instance, that's in our children's garden, but there are a lot of adults that are Lego groupies. And so next year, you know, that's a way we can differentiate content Um and have you know a physical presence that's geared for one age group, and then expand that um, for next year. So the mm-hmm. the stats are great. Um, I would say that it, it did get stronger when we um, took away the um, dollar charge. But yeah, I bet. Um, and now now it'll just be a cost of doing business, I should say. And it and it is compared to creating an app. I mean, it's night and day as far as the. Yeah, yeah, feasibility. Kristen has a question in the chat window huh? that yeah. we can all see, and it basically, that's a great question, Kristen. What happens when you send the text? Some with some phones and some plans, not our system. Mm-hmm. You might get a pop up that says, "If you click this, if you send a text, you might incur a text." charge. And I think your carrier is being cautious saying, do you know that if you send a text, you may get you may get a charge? Um, or if you click a, um, a link, it may say, okay, you have a, uh, a text charge. So um, I think that's just indicative of the, of the phone. There is no charge to the user unless you don't have texting on your phone. So... Okay, right. well... No, I think that's a good point. I think you're right. Yeah. All right. Let us... Thank you so much, Lisa. We'll keep moving on, and if you have to dash, that is just fine. Okay, great. All right. That was great. Thanks so much. Uh, we're going to move over now to Stephanie. Stephanie had been in, uh, using uh, at Valley Forge cell phone tours for a while, and um, has added or just starting to add some uh, smartphone content So here's what everybody has to do to see Stephanie's. So the key thing, everybody, on your phone, if you already texted in, you need to text in the word END, E-N-D, because if you don't, you're going to be in another account. And then do VALLEY. So do end, and you'll get, thank you for texting, end, and then do valley. And then in the little chat window, tell me what you see. So I'm waiting for someone to text end. As 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 we say in the chat window, you've got to text end because otherwise you're still in the Denver account. We've got to end that session. Brian looks like Brian. Okay, Brian's got it. Faith has got it. Okay, you guys are A+. plus. Great. All right, Stephanie, let's chat a little bit about the thought process on the smartphone. I know you've been thinking about apps and smartphones for a long, long time, and you're just about ready to launch this. If you could just share with people basically kind of your apprehension, which is the whole point of this chat today, and then what made you say, well, maybe it's time to do something, and uh, bring us up to speed on that. Absolutely. So I work for the National Park Service, so federal government, so you can understand there's a little bit of red tape to work through with us. We're not a private organization that can individually raise funds to do a sort of an, an app, which they are very expensive and can be very nice. Um, the National Park Service as a whole has been working towards making very um, very expensive, highly technical apps for certain parks. Um, and they've worked really well because they've been complex style parks like the National Mall in Washington, D.C., or like the Chesapeake Bay area, or Boston, which has 
40 plus different sites and something. So it required it required a lot of detail work, but it's not really a framework that our park can use and most parks can use. So we've been going back and forth on what we want to do. Do we want to invest in something like this? Do we want to wait until the government has something that they can pass down for us? Do we, you know, look at this mobile website thing? And the conclusion that we finally came to was this is the best option for us because not only are we saving by not having to worry about what system people are bringing when they bring their own device to the park, and, you know, we're, we're definitely saving on the money end, end as well. And, you know, working with Guide by Cell already to do the cell phone tour a few years ago has been great. So one of our challenges, really, since we're a 3,500-acre park, we have nine different unique tour stops that one would have to drive to. It's not quite as simple as, you know, being able to just walk through a museum, seeing a sign and going. So it's going to take a little bit more effort for us to get people out in the park and discovering all the different sites that we have. So what we decided to do with the mobile website is take each one of those nine tour stops plus one of our other recreational areas to make it ten and really giving people an idea of what they can see and what the history is about the sites that they're experiencing while they're out in the park. A lot of the information that's in here is repurposed from our park maps, from our park waysides, um, and it was really easy and convenient to work with the system on the back end. Um, I normally do content management. I manage the park's website as my regular job. So the interface to work with Guide by Cell was wonderful and it was intuitive. And anytime I had an issue, I got on the phone or I sent an email and we figured it out. And um, this, this has been really great. I'm really excited to launch this. I think we calculated at one point our number one site for living history and interpretation. We're only able to staff that site 20% of the time. So to have some content and to be able to stream the videos that we already have on YouTube through this, to use some of the audio prompts that we already used for our cell phone tour on this, just add so much more rich content to everything that we're offering here. Um, in, in addition, we have a couple of uh, maps that are on here. So I actually I had this bookmarked on my phone yesterday when I was on the trail, and I kind of forgot where I was, so I just went right in there and downloaded a PDF of one of our maps, and I could figure out where I was. Uh, we're very fortunate Steph to have a lot of cell phone service, so it, it works well. Stephanie, you had, uh, I remember one of the early discussions was you wanted a nice calendaring feature. Oh, and yeah. And so talk a little bit about why why that's important to you, and should it be important to, you know, we've got a wide cross-section of people on the phone. What's your advice to them about incorporating calendaring, and uh, what should they do? Sure. So I am a big proponent of Google Calendars or any type of calendaring system because if I didn't have one, I would be all over the place. <laughs> so uh, we have a Google Calendar set up, and uh, we were able to work with Guide by Cell to have a really nice interface to pull all of that, all of those features onto your phone. I've seen apps where they have a lot of information on their calendars. But there's no way to save the information either, so you would have to make sure you go back into the app later and re you know remember that there was something on there that you found that was interesting. What Guide by Cell has been able to do for us is if you see an event on our calendar and you have a Google Calendar, you're able to just save that right to your personal one if you're using your smartphone, which is really beneficial, I think, to us. Um, and we have a number of events throughout the year. Um, just regular programs every almost every day in the summer. So our event calendar is pretty full of information, and it's great for a lot of our local users as well as our, as well as our out of town visitors to be able just to have everything in one place. Because the schedule of events that we have on our website wasn't able to pull over. It's not terribly convenient because you have to search by the day um, with the Google Calendar that we have on our mobile website. It it's from the day that you're there, and it will add every single event that's available on that calendar. Um, and you can, you know, narrow down your searches. You can search through like this month or next month. It's, it's a lot more intuitive than what we even have on our regular website. 
So Stephanie, in, in the chat window, Stephanie, we have a couple of questions here. Judy has a question about uh, some national parks don't have cell service. If Valley Forge didn't have cell service, would you then go the route of telling people to download an app? Or what's your suggestion for people that are, that are you know, either in aquariums where cell, cell service isn't so great or where there's no Wi-Fi or parks? What do you, what do you recommend there? That's a, that's a great question. Um, fortunately, we didn't have to struggle too much with that because we do have really good cell phone service here. Um, I am familiar with a lot of parks out west that are a little bit more remote, and they do have apps. Um, it's nice that you're able to download everything in one spot and take that with you. Um, the, if, they, if you want to go with the mobile website and maybe suggest people do some trip planning in advance, they'd be able to, you know, gain content from your mobile website there. But if you if you don't have cell phone service, you're gonna have to download you're gonna have to download the app somewhere where you can get the Wi Fi connection or maybe you have something hooked up in your visitor center. But um yeah. with for the for the mobile website if you don't have cell phone service it might be a little more difficult. And I think that the, the organizations we've talked to where there's just no cell phone rece reception or there's no Wi-Fi, I think the only alternative is really an app. And apps yeah. are a little more expensive, but visitors want something, and they will take the easiest thing. But if they have to download an app, they'll do an app. Uh, we've got a few more questions, and then we'll move on. Uh, Chris, uh, Kristen asked, how much time did it take your staff to really do, I think I'll expand her question to two things. How much time did it take to get and assemble all the content? Because when we talk to clients, sometimes they say, well, the interface is easy, but I got to put all this content together. And then question two is, once you had the content using these cloud systems, how hard or easy was it to get it up there? That's a great question, too. Um, the hardest thing for us was deciding how we were going to organize it to be quite honest. Um, so our current website, it takes you through a bunch of different areas where you can plan your visit. You can you know, volunteer at the park. You can learn about the history. And it has a bunch of different uh, titles like that. For our purposes for the mobile website, we wanted to do a really great wayfinding informational uh, movie. So we really just focused on those core stops that we have. So once we did that, I went and searched of content that was already exist in existence. Um, I went to our park map. I went to our website. I looked at our wayside. And it didn't take that long to compile the content because really when you're on here, you don't want to be reading a book on your mobile website. You want something that is short and concise and to the point and gets you as much information as you can but still keeps your attention. So on a lot of our pages, I will have a short blurb and then pair it with a video or pair it with some audio or a good image that gets the point across. And I, the, the mobile website allows you to you know, just add another page onto it if you want to expand into more detail because some people really do want to read all of the information. And it's nice to have it in the palm of your hand or maybe come back to it later. But at, at first glance, they just want that small bit of information that they can bite on and, and really and, and consume well. So it wasn't too bad. Pairing down the information is always harder than finding all of the information. Um, and then getting it on the actual site, I use a content management system, so it was pretty easy and intuitive for me to go ahead and do that. Um, if you have anyone who works on your website, you can you can use them to assist you with that. But Guide by Cell has really great um, client assistance to help you with any any issues uploading anything. So, I mean, and if you need if you're working on it and you want some help, feel free to call me as well. All right, Stephanie, thanks. And if you have to dash, that's fine and we'll keep on moving. Thanks so much. All right, fun and easy. That was our third or fourth trend that we're seeing. What we found is if you make it really easy, people will do it. But the reward's got to be greater than the effort. So the National Air and Space Museum, they've got a cell phone tour, but they've also got a little text game. And you can all play it. First, everybody, let's do this again. Let's do end on our cell phones. And then we're going to test your astronomy knowledge, everybody, which is kind of fun. 
So uh, a museum would have a sign that would say, play our planet game or something. So do end and then type in the word N-A-S-M, put a space, and do game. Do not put N-A-S-M and game together or you'll probably get a Domino's pizza coupon or something. So do N-A-S-M, put a space, and do not let your phones auto-correct, or once again, you'll end up at a Jamba Juice store or who knows where. So in the little chat window, go ahead and tell me what you get when you get that. All right, Kristen. So what the Air and Space and other clients have said is, once I have people in my venue, how do I entertain them? How do I educate them? How do I combine that? So texting is such a fun way to do that. And if you play this little game like Kristen's doing, it's very addictive and it's very easy to set up. And you can take people on a little treasure hunt or ask them some questions about planets or Pluto or whatever it happens to be. It's very easy to do. It's low tech. And uh, you will find that it's a very enjoyable thing and educational thing for your institution. Uh, we're going to talk um, uh, to Darren right now. One of the key things that a lot of our clients come to us and say is our visitors want information now. And I think that's just how all of us are. We don't want to wait to go home and search that. We'll just pull out our phone at dinner and search it. They have a very low attention span, and they don't really want a tour. And they're trying to figure out, okay, how do I get just the right amount of information on my hand? And um, Stephanie in the little chat window was replying to Kristen that maybe some of you saw that, the basic website for most of your venues has a lot of content. Well, that's not as much content. That's way too much content that people want when they come to a museum. So uh, let's talk to uh, Darren Rudloff. And uh, before we do, let's have everybody do one more exercise. Type the word end in and then do the C-F-D-O-W-M. It looks like an eye chart. But don't let it um, autocorrect. I'm typing while I'm talking here. C F W C F D O W M. If I did this right, we should get a text to the Cheyenne Frontier Days Museum. And Darren and I go back maybe six or seven years. Darren and I have been on panels together around the country. And uh, Darren is the chief executive officer at Visit Cheyenne. And Darren, why don't you talk a little bit about kind of your mobile journey and then how you ended up with something that we see here on the screen. Uh, very well, Dave. Again, I am the, uh, the CEO of our tourism promotion organization for the county. So we're the visitor bureau for the county. Uh, and we took a little uh, different route than many of the uh, – other speakers or other clients of Guide by Cell in that we established a system. We were the umbrella organization that helped organize a system of uh, what is now eight cell phone audio tours in the community. There are seven museums in Cheyenne that each have a cell phone audio tour. There's also a uh, art tour in the community that has its cell phone uh, audio uh, tour. And again, we started this process like uh, we've heard numerous times today as a way of providing additional information to um, our guests on a device that they're very familiar with, their own phone. We didn't want to um, have people perhaps rent a wand and how how do I use this? Is it sanitary, etc.? This is my own phone. I'm very familiar with it. I can use it. So we went down this path of the cell phone audio tour. 
Um, one of the overreaching ideas we had in Cheyenne as the Visitor Bureau is one of my goals is not just to enhance the experience of all of our guests or visitors to the community, but we also want to extend their stay in the community so they uh, enjoy it more, they spend more money here, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So by having a system in each of the museums, the technology looks the same, the marketing looks the same, the technology, the experience is somewhat similar. Um, we wanted to show a lot of our Old West history and attractions uh, in a new way with new technology. After having the uh, cell phone technology for a number of years and being successful with it, uh, we've now graduated to mobile websites because uh, as we've heard, many um, museum websites have a wealth of data, a wealth of information uh, that really isn't uh, formatted for mobile devices. It might work well on a tablet, but on a cell phone, um, it doesn't come across um, as easily readable or easily digestible. And of course, it's also way too much. Uh, so we've basically taken the next step to go with mobile websites uh, for all of our museums, and several of our museums have uh, moved more quickly than others, and the Old West Museum here is one of them. Darren, what about uh, QR codes, texting in, what have been your thoughts about which to use, or what's, how, how should people access, what, what's your recommendations to the people that are listening to you about how to access the information? Um, we're encouraging our museums to experiment and use uh, whichever technique makes the most sense for them. Uh, basically, um, we're asking our museums to look at the individual exhibits um, uh, as, um, or, or the mobile website uh, as a rabbit hole, if you will, to get more information about this exhibit uh, and to use text, QR codes, games, uh, etc to let that visitor explore as deeply as he or she may uh, desire. Uh, and if the customer is not interested in that certain exhibit, they can walk on to the next one and explore further um, uh, as, they, as they see fit. And you've got seven or eight different venues, and, and I know that some pick this up more quickly than others. What's the ten, what, what are you seeing with the folks that picked it up versus didn't pick it up, is this mobile web platform not for everybody, or what's, what, what are you seeing in terms of why, um, why some do it, in terms of put it together and some don't? Uh, well, there are a lot of competing technologies out there. Uh, I personally feel that the uh, mobile websites are the way to go. Um, I know, for instance, uh, the state of Wyoming, they have a number of different bureaucratic rules. They can't move as quickly as others. And they are caught in um, kind of the app world at the moment. They're, they're kind of stuck. They're trying to decide uh, VHS or Betamax. Um, they're, uh, mm -hmm. they're caught, and unfortunately, it seems like they're uh, not making any answers, not making any uh, uh, steps forward as they um, have uh, analysis paralysis. I think that is what is holding back uh, a couple of our museums to, to move forward. But the several that have, um, they've just jumped right in. But I think the uh, competing technology and just wanting to make sure you don't make a mistake is, is causing them to uh, hold back. Mm -hmm. My my uh, Our experience has been you have to take a leap. You have to jump in and do something. Your customers are already carrying cell phones. They're carrying computers. If you're not helping them explore your exhibits more deeply, they're doing it on their own anyway. They'll go to Wikipedia. They'll go to Google and try to get more information. So we wanted to make sure that um, the museums that wanted to had the technology to be the official source. You don't want someone to go to Wikipedia and find incorrect information when you're the official source. So uh, that's why uh, we've encouraged our museums to uh, use the mobile technology, the mobile websites, 
uh, as opposed to uh, the app and, and build on the system as it is. Darren, we've got a question from Faith in the little chat window. How easy is it to update? Obviously, with an app, it's a little bit more complicated. Maybe you could just talk about when your team, and you've got seven or eight people that work um, at these museums uh, uh, for you on this, if they want to make changes, do they come to you? Do you do them? Do they do them? How easy has it been to make changes and keep it fresh? Uh, it's very easy. The guide-by-cell system, the technology is very user-friendly. Um, many of the museums basically had a, uh, a prototype mobile website up within an hour, two hours, and it's very intuitive and changes can be made quite quickly. Uh, and I must add, that's not just for the mobile websites, but also for uh, the older cell phone audio tours. Um, you can basically re-record and, and you're set and ready to go virtually instantly. It's more, than, it's more of an organizational issue. You've got to figure out you know, what information, how it should be organized. But once you get it together, it is extremely easy and intuitive to update any of these systems. Yeah, I think what, what you're saying was similar to what Stephanie was saying, is it's not the building, it's not even really the assembling, it's, you know, when I look at your screen here for the Old West Museum, I'm sure that um, Brian and the team, they probably spend quite a bit of time just kind of thinking through what is really relevant to a visitor, and what do I not want to put on that site, because if it's not relevant to that visitor, don't muck up the mobile experience. So I think probably picking the right content is as challenging as anything. Uh, yes, I would, I would agree totally. Uh, another question here from Casey, a little bit about uh, geolocation. Darren, you've got walking tours, you've got all kinds of things. What do you think about geolocation? Is that something that, that, that you hope kind of the world migrates to, or what, what's your thought about that? What's your advice and thoughts? Uh, I think that is uh, a very exciting uh, trend that's that's happening. Uh, of course, the counter argument is when is it too much? When does it become intrusive? That you know, do I want to do I want to get a text that says information is now available? You know, your informa more, Do you want more information about this sculpture? You know, he, he, uh, click here. Do I want a text like that? Um, around every exhibit, how much is too much. Um, but, you know, again, that's uh, if, if that can be done easily and in the right level to not uh, become too cumbersome to the visitor, uh, I think it's a very exciting uh, new trend and, and use of new technology. Again, it, it, I think the challenge is just going to be how much is too much. Yeah, and Casey, when we've talked to some clients, they're really excited about it, like what Darren is saying, but the, when we piloted some of those things, the users are very reluctant for two reasons. If they're not uh, young and hip and know their phone, they don't really know how to turn that feature on in their settings. And two, they're a little worried about kind of the creepiness factor of, I wonder if I turn this on, is something else going to happen in the background? I think that'll eventually go away as we find that the the benefit of having it turned on is outweighs the kind of the, those two things. So I do agree with with Darren. It's going to come, but I'm not sure it's quite it's, it's not quite ready yet or we we as citizens are not quite ready yet or visitors, but in another year or so it's going to be here in a big way. Yeah, I I would I would agree, Dave. I, again, it's it's how do I turn it on? Oh my goodness, I don't want this information how do I turn it off? If I turn it off, will I disrupt something else I enjoy on my phone? So um, there are still issues to be worked out there. Okay, Darren, thanks. We're going to move on. And if you can stay, great. If you have to dash, that's okay, too. Um, I realize that we're coming up on um, the hour, and maybe I'll ask folks. We have another five or six different examples. Maybe in the little chat window, the folks that would like me to wrap it up, go ahead and make a little note. If the consensus is take another 10 minutes, we'll take another 10 minutes. So why don't you folks that are uh, still here make a little note in the meeting chat window and either either vote for let's uh, 
let's accelerate or let's do it in five or ten minutes. All right, Jeff says ten. Chris, no more. All right, Chris. All right, another ten. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna move quickly and get through this. Uh, game-like, another big trend. How can we make this game-like? This is a great example, so I'm glad we're uh, I'm glad we're doing it. So everybody, take out your phone and send um, the word end and then spy to five six five one two. So you're just basically replying with the word end to move out of the Cheyenne Frontier Day, and we're going to move into the world of spies. And when you do, go ahead and um, tell me what you see in your text window, because you are participating with working with the French to figure out how to beat the British, and you're at Colonial Williamsburg right now. All right, so we've got Mina and Brian. So Colonial Williamsburg came to us maybe five years ago and said, we want to do a scavenger hunt, but we just don't want to do a scavenger hunt. We want to tie it in with education, and we want to make it interactive, not too easy, not too hard. And uh, so we worked with a great um, game designer and um, – his name is John Maccabee. He worked for a company in San Francisco called City Mystery. He's done a lot of Smithsonian games. And he worked with Colonial Williamsburg and came up with RevQuest. And they changed the game all the time. I see that you all have the, um, you've got the black schedule. Let me give you another little clue that you would only know if you listened to the, um, the, the session at Colonial Williamsburg, if you reply with the word Lee, I'm going to type it out here, you will get the next message. So go ahead and type Lee. And what happens is, is you go on a quest. And it's not just a scavenger hunt, but it's actually a quest. And when you walk around, I was just there a couple months ago, I see these signs. And these signs, by using your little guidebook, you can tell what these interpretation signs mean, and they give you clues. And you meet a guy like this guy with the hat, and he will tell you about Lee and what to do next. And then off you go on your quest this one is the Black Chambers, which was the one that they used last year. And so here's a, an exam, a picture taken of not only a family, but other people. Because what I uh, witnessed when I was in uh, Williamsburg doing this a month or two ago is people congregate together because the clues are not exactly succinct. You really need to struggle. Oftentimes, finding a 13-year-old is the answer. And when you do, then you get the next clue on what to do next, and it's telling you all about history. So it's a narrative. It's not a competition. It's a quest. And it's only using text messaging. So what Darren and um, Lisa and Stephanie were using is uh, more mobile websites. But this is all texting. Here are just some screenshots. We took our teenage son. The RevQuest game is a must. You will find a lot of people writing reviews on TripAdvisor and Yelp. Here's another one. Let's see. You should visit the RevQuest booth to get your free package. And when you go to pay your admission, they say, do you want to play the scavenger hunt RevQuest spy game? And they give you a little purple scarf, which identifies you as one of the knowledge people, and a little booklet. And it's really fun. Here's one. And um, near the bottom of this paragraph, it says, both kids really enjoyed RevQuest. It's a hunt for clues game that was pretty challenging. Definitely worth the time. So you'll find that if you create these little games, they can be educational and really fun. All right, one more, and uh, it's about marketing. We found that if you have 
uh, some marketing ideas, you can be indirect and get people to do things that otherwise they might not do. So what's an example? Well, an example is at Monterey Bay Aquarium. People will text in when they enter the aquarium and um, receive text throughout the day. Let me give you an example here. If we text in end, everybody text in end again, and then text in the word feeding, you will be signed up for notifications from Monterey Bay Aquarium down there on the coast of uh, Monterey in California. And what they will do is they have preset text messages that can be go out at certain times of the day, or they can be pushed by a visitor services person. And they'll either do it for crowd controls, or they'll move people to areas that are not getting a lot of traffic. And then at the very end of today, if you don't reply stop, at 6 o'clock today, you'll get a text that will say something like, I hope you enjoyed the visit. Um, Would you like to be on our email list? And what a clever way to get people to voluntarily opt in to give you their email. And that's what Monterey will do. Perez Art Museum said they've got this new exhibition coming. They'd like to get people to opt in. So one more. This is our last one, and then we're wrapping up. If you all text end and then do cruise, just like this is a screenshot of one of the pages on the Perez Art Museum down there in Miami off of their website. It's really interesting. It'll say, to enter the Fabulous 7 Night Caribbean Cruise contest, reply to this text with your email address. Well, isn't that great um, that um, we have a way to capture an email address from telling someone that I want to enter this cruise about the, um, about the, um, that's affiliated with the Perez Art Museum. So that has been very successful. And I think we have one more, and I think we're then done. Yeah, the last trend we're seeing, the eighth trend that we've seen this year, is a lot of departments working together. So how can marketing and education or in development all work together And San Diego State has done a good example. They have something. Here's a picture of me. They are giving out all to all of their, is it, I think they're freshmen, Catherine, this shirt. And we just picked this up yesterday. And if you look on the right side, welcome to SDSU. You can text, in this case, bracelet. But let me show you what they've done here. Text the word end, and this is the last time you'll have to text. And then text the word grad. And when you do, you'll have opted in to their commencement. And, of course, this just passed in June. But the idea was, let's send our grads a text message during the last couple weeks of school with important information. And then at the very end, we'll ask for their email address or we'll ask if they want to be opted in for future alerts. So it's kind of a clever way to give them some information, use mobile to do that. But the real purpose, other than providing them valuable information during the last two weeks of class, is to get their email address. So that is the final example. If all of you want to be out of those lists that you signed up for, it's very easy. You just reply stop and that will end all future text. If you want to remain on, you can always reply stop at a later date. It's sometimes fun for museum people to see how other organizations like Perez and other groups are um, using the texting feature. So you can always do stop. So that is the end of our little journey here through what are the trends we're seeing. And um, once again, if you would like a copy of the slides, Catherine and I will send them to you. And if you have more questions, stay around and type them in the little chat window. And then Catherine will unmute all of our phones and you can ask uh, us questions or Darren or anybody else that still is around. So thank you so much. If anybody wants more info, info or demos, just obviously just let us know and we'll help you out, or if you want us to do the same presentation for your team, be glad to do it.
Thanks, Brian. That was uh, super for your comments. We'll look at some of those comments about uh, things that you saw. And if you have questions before you go, obviously type them in the little chat window. And uh, Catherine, I guess you could unmute. And if anybody else wants to chat, there may be a few people that want to chat. Okay, so I've muted everybody. So if you want to say something, now is the time. Judy's got a question about cost. Uh, it's a subscription service, and for little tiny organizations, it's probably $1,500 a year. And for large organizations that use this a lot and might roll it out to multiple organizations, it can go from $1,500 a year to $10,000 a year. But the, the typical organization for one of these services pays maybe $100 a month, $200 a month, and then it moves up from there. But they're not overly expensive, and it's something that people can try, look at statistics, and see how many people are using it. Any more questions? If not, thank you all, and we will sign out. Oh, Judy, how many different companies are in this business? There are a lot of companies that provide mobile websites. Very few companies that kind of combine the texting and the audio on the mobile website together. I think we may be the only one that combines them all. But there's a couple of mobile companies in the space. There are companies like Antenna and Acoustic Guide that have been in the handheld business for a long time, and they also have apps that they develop. So there's probably a handful of five, five organizations or so. I haven't seen anybody that's got the combination of the websites and the texting and the audio. Thanks, Keith. All right. Thank you, everybody, and shoot us an email if you have questions. Bye.